You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. My name is Luke Vanderlinden, and I am the Vice President of Membership and Marketing for the Retail and Hospitality ISAC and host of the RH ISAC podcast here on the CyberWire Network. Um, I wanted to be a television producer. It was not a cybersecurity professional because that career, that uh, that possibility didn't even exist. I wanted to work in the uh, broadcasting industry and, and be a Hollywood mogul. My first career, by the way, was in 1977. Uh, I became a child model and actor. So it might have been a little bit uh, inspired by my um, flirtation with the industry at an early age. Um, but yeah, I majored in media studies uh, when I went to college, uh, basically the business behind television. Uh, and while I was in college, I got a job at the uh, local PBS station where I was living. And that turned into my first, uh, the first 11 or so years of my career working in, uh, working in television. Uh, it was PBS, though, so uh, it wasn't exactly in production or, or as a Hollywood mogul, but uh, swiftly became part of their fundraising apparatus and their membership apparatus. Uh, that's what I did. I, I ran those for a while. I also created the online fundraising initiative uh, for that station that was then emulated at the time by a number of other stations. So early on, that was kind of my claim to fame. As the as the internet was starting to be a thing, we we learned how to use it uh, and use it to market and and to raise money for the, for our initiatives. Yeah, so that's how I fell into. I guess we'll call it uh, back. Back then, I was doing basically direct response marketing. So uh, using email, uh, back then that was the best tool we had, but then that would turn into to social media and then various other tools. And interestingly, after um, I progressed through various stages in the fundraising departments at, uh, at that station, uh, I ended up going from new media, email and online, to old media. Uh, that turned into a job working in direct mail. Uh, but it was really... Um, using any tool to reach out to people to get them to take the action you want them to take. So uh, I worked at an agency, a small family-owned uh, agency, for about seven years after I, uh, after I left the station, working with a lot of public broadcasting stations, but then branching out to other areas like public libraries, uh, advocacy groups. So that got me interested in, in working with individuals who support organizations and who are active involved with organizations. And uh, I ultimately uh, fell into the association world, uh, which is technically uh, what the RHI SAC really is. I wear kind of two hats, well, three hats if you count the, the podcast hat, but we'll, we'll leave that one aside. But uh, two hats really is, is the, the care and feeding of our members. So uh, everything from uh, when someone wants to join, us making that happen, to uh, just onboarding them once they do join, checking in, make sure they're getting as much out of their membership as, as we can. And the, the big part of my day is, is taken up with interacting with and having calls with, with our members uh, and, and prospective members. The other hat I wear is I'm part of the leadership team. So just looking at the overall strategic direction of the organization, are we serving our members from that from that higher uh, altitude vantage point uh, and making plans for six months to a year to five years in the future? So it's really great to be able to be on the ground uh, and also up in the air doing kind of doing both, both things, both strategic and tactical uh, functions.
you know, I'm, I'm kind of proud of, of the way I work with, um, I have a great team uh, of four uh, direct reports. They're amazing. I think for us internally, it's important, and I think the other members of the leadership team feel this way, uh, to have a, a, a fair amount of transparency. We work with people who uh, secrecy and non-disclosure and keeping things uh, kind of quiet is, is a key, key part of the job. But we also run a sharing community. And so uh, just as we want our members to be uh, feel free to share with each other uh, on our sharing platforms, we want um, our staff to be open with each other. We're also entirely remote. So um, for us to create that corporate culture when you're not running into people at the water cooler or you know, smelling someone's fish leftovers that they're heating up in the microwave from the day before, or having that, you know, office space type cubicle culture um, uh, is important too. And I, and I think we've done a great job building a transparent uh, and great corporate culture, even though we're, we're uh, flung all over the country. There's a skills gap, obviously. There's a huge number of open positions. And how do you fill them? And, and you know, talking to people, oh, I'm interested in that, but I'm not technical. It's absolutely true. As long as you have a, a willingness to learn, an interest, a passion about this topic, you can learn the skills. And not all roles are technical. You know, I've, I've picked up a lot. It's great if you come with, and in my opinion, this is key, a, a good level of security awareness. But again, you don't have to be technical. You can go in and have a passion for it, have a passion for learning, uh, and you can learn the, the technical skills uh, if those are required for the job. When I worked for that small uh, family-owned business, uh, the president and founder of the company once said to me, an expert is someone who's done something once. So every experience that you have is so valuable, even if you fail, because you can learn something from it. This is only the third job where I've had direct reports, and um, but I love managing people, just as one example. Uh, but I've learned from the mistakes that I've made uh, and from the way I've interacted with, with direct reports in the past, and so uh, I think I'm good at it now. I think with age comes this knowledge, but also with experiences. So, I mean, to that point, don't be afraid to go out there and fail. Give it a shot. I, I think that's... Um, one of the best ways to be successful is, is not to be afraid to fail, but to go out and give it a shot and, and learn from what, from what you've done. If you think about the largest retailers who are, of our, who are our members and the number of consumers uh, that they're able to protect because of their membership with us, it's just, it, you know, it's an organization that no one's heard of. They don't need to hear about us. They don't need to know we exist unless you work in this industry. And just to me, I, I don't need my name to be known. And just the, the but the sheer impact this organization has uh, is so great that I'm, to me, that's that's just a great legacy to have. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. <laughs>